Um, cool. All right, so we are going to be talking a little bit more in depthly about these transition metal complexes that we had uh, introduced last time, talked about how we go about naming these. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit more in depthly about their properties. So first of all, one of the things that I had said when we were first starting about them was that these transition metal ions can bind up to six of these ligands. And so the uh, um, orientations that you're going to see are always going to be one of these four orientations here. If it does have that full six amount of ligands bound, that's this octahedral complex. It could also have four ligands bound, in which case it would either be a square planar or a tetrahedral complex, or it can have just two ligands bound, in which case it would be this linear complex. Um, the octahedral is the most common and followed sure. by the square planar and the tetrahedral. The linear there <laughs> does happen, but it's less common, okay? So we're actually going to spend a lot of time talking about the octahedrals and then expand that, those concepts to the linear and the square planar here. Um, one of the things that I want to sort of say real quick about these is this just goes back to what you would have studied when you were talking about like Lewis structures and Vesper, what's called valence bond theory. This idea that the atomic orbitals that we've been discussing, the 1s, the 2s, the 2p, et cetera, uh, they can mix together to form these bonding orbitals, these bonding hybrid hybrid orbitals. So for an octahedral, that is 2d orbitals mixing with an s orbital and 3p orbitals to form these six octahedral hybrid orbitals, what we call ds2 sp3 orbitals. Um, if it's linear, I'm sorry, if it's uh, tetrahedral, that's S P three hybridized, so one S orbital mixing with three P orbitals, and the square planar is D S P two hybridized. Okay, and then linear is just one S orbital mixing with one P orbital. But so these are these valence bond theory, these hybridized orbitals, which are creating those bonding orbitals, allowing those ligands to bind. Okay. So what we're going to be introducing here is what's called crystal field theory. And crystal field theory expands upon valence bond theory. So, and it, it does so in order to explain why transition metal complexes Two important properties. So uh, actually, let's just say explain transition metal complexes in terms of two important measurable quantities, their color and magnetic properties. Okay. So we have this valence bond theory. We're going to explain, or we're going to sort of expand upon that with this crystal field theory. And that's going to help us explain why these transition metal complexes are so brightly colored, as well as the magnetic property of these transition metal complexes. Okay. So. First thing, and, and again, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about these octahedral complexes, and then we'll, um, which again, were these D2SP3 hybridized, and then we're going to uh, sort of expand upon that and apply it to uh, the octahedrals, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, square planers and the tetrahedrals. Okay, and what we're going to see is that the ligand arrangement leads to a splitting pattern of those of these orbitals. Okay. 
So we have our um, hybridized orbitals, our D2 sp3 hybridized orbitals. Okay. So if we look at just the D electrons here, because these are really going to be what helps to explain the properties of these elements, um, focusing again on the D orbitals. We have, if we have a free atom, those d orbitals are all at an equal energy level, right? That's what we were doing when we were uh, drawing our um, electron configuration diagrams. There was one box for the S orbital, three boxes for the P orbital, and five for the D orbital. Okay. But when we put start like putting ligands all around this molecule here, it's going to lead to this splitting of these D orbitals here, where they're not going to all be the same energy. Okay. This goes back to the geometry of these D orbitals here. We have these d orbitals, and now all of a sudden we're starting to put ligands all around here, right? So a octahedral has them on each axis. Okay. And because you have these ligands, these negatively charged ligands, they sort of interact um, with these electron orbitals in a repulsive manner, right? These electron orbitals contain negatively charged electrons. We have these ligands with their lone pairs that are now coming in. The lone pairs on those ligands will react uh, or rather interact uh, repulsively with these electron orbitals here, which is what leads to a splitting of the energy of these orbitals. So certain ones like these ones down here, the lobes of these orbitals are all sort of um, not on the same axis as where the ligands are for all of these three down here, the D, Z, X, the Y, X, and the X, Y, right? But if we go up here, now if I put a ligand on the very top and on the very bottom, it's going to interact very strongly with this D, Z squared orbital because of the orientation of that orbital. Likewise, the D, X squared, Y squared. Again, if we put ligands in this octahedral manner here, we see that they are just directly aligned with these different orbitals here, causing the strong repulsion. So we're going to see a splitting in the energy of these orbitals, where these three are going to be lower energy, and these two are going to be higher energy when compared with just, you know, your naked D orbital all by itself, right? So here's my free D orbitals, all of them, all the same energy. And now what we're going to see is the splitting where we have two of them, that z squared and the x squared minus y squared, that are higher in energy, and the other three are lower in energy. Okay. And you don't need to know um, which, which orbitals are which. I mean, it makes sense when you, again, look at the... Uh, slide that we were just looking on and the orientation of these orbitals. What really matters is this splitting pattern here with two orbitals that are higher energy and three that are lower energy. Okay. And so just to sort of point out our constants page for this particular chapter shows exactly that. So for an octahedral, this is the splitting pattern that you would see. We're going to see different splitting patterns when we talk about tetrahedrals and square planars. We'll, we'll get to that here in a second. But what's important is that you have three lower energy orbitals and two higher energy orbitals for your octahedral configuration. Okay. And, and you know, of course, the whole shtick is we'll see why this is important for the magnetism of these compounds as well as the color that they absorb. All right, so first of all, with regard to now our new d orbital splitting pattern, the difference in energy between these two orbitals here is represented by this uppercase delta, and this is called the crystal field splitting energy.
right? So the difference in energy, right? So we have these d orbitals. Now that there are these six ligands around, they've split the energy of those d orbitals. Three of them are lower in energy. Two of them are higher in energy. The difference in energy between those two orbitals is what's called the crystal field splitting energy. All right. So how can this whole thing you be used to explain color? Color is a result of electrons transitioning, transitioning between lower energy orbitals and higher energy orbitals. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I mean, if I have, let's say that we have, um, you know, a D3 configuration where there are three electrons living in these lower energy orbitals, what happens is a photon comes along and it kicks one of those electrons from this lower energy orbital to the higher energy orbital. That's what the absorption of a photon is doing. One of these complexes will absorb a photon, and in the process, they'll kick a lower energy electron up to one of those higher energy orbitals. And eventually, this thing will relax back down, releasing heat. But that's why these complexes absorb photons, is to promote electrons, what's called excitation of electrons, to kick them from a lower energy orbital to a higher energy orbital. So photons are absorbed to excite those electrons. Okay, so then how does this crystal field splitting uh, help to explain the color? Well, it turns out that the energy of the photon that's absorbed is going to be equal to that crystal field splitting energy, All right? That's how much energy a photon has, is it's got just enough energy to kick it from this lower energy orbital to this higher energy orbital, the exact same energy, right? So the energy of that photon is equal to the difference in energy between those two orbitals. Okay, and so this can be explained using this equation, Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of that light is equal to the energy of a photon. Um, this maybe rings a bell from the first semester you would have talked about this. Um, in general, this idea of compounds absorbing light uh, it always comes from the same sort of source, from photons that are exciting electrons from lower energy orbitals to higher energy orbitals. With regard to these transition metal complexes, it's because of this crystal field splitting that we see. Okay. So we can use this observable fact, these photons absorbing light at a certain frequency in order to calculate the difference in energy between these orbitals, the crystal field splitting energy, okay? So for example, a compound like titanium with six waters bound to it, hexa aqua titanium two, this absorbs at a frequency of, what is it? 500 nanometers is the peak absorption of this compound right here. And so because of that, we can use this equation to figure out what that crystal field splitting energy is. Okay, um, so you'll actually find these values on your constants page as well. I'm just going to sort of plug in what they are here. But the values for H and C, so let's just take this to a new page so I don't run out of room. Okay. So Planck's constant. H 
H is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. And those are in units of joules per second. C is the speed of light, has a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8, and that's meters per second. Okay. Um, the wavelengths of visible light that are absorbed are measured in nanometers. <clears throat> we're going to need to square away our units to cancel out with the units of C. So we're going to have to use the fact that there are 10 to the negative 9 meters in one nanometer. So plugging all this into our equation here, we have that delta is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times that 3 times 10 to the 8. And let me be good about my units. This is joules second. This is meters per second. And then the wavelength is that 500 nanometers times the fact that 10 to the negative nine meters in one nanometer, okay? So let me should I have a calculator ready here. Okay, so we get 3.9756. We're being good about our sig figs. Well, say it's 500. And this is times 10 to the negative 19. Uh, if we look at our units, what happens with our units? Nanometers cancel out. Meters will then cancel out, seconds will cancel out, and so we're left with energy units of joules, and this is per complex ion. So typically these crystal field splitting energies are reported in terms of kilojoules per mole. So in order to finish this off, we're going to take our value here, we're going to multiply it by Avogadro's number. So if this is joules per ion, we'll multiply that by 6.0 ions in one mole. Hopefully we all remember Avogadro's number. Um, and then again, it's uh, typical to report these in kilojoules per mole. So we're going to use the fact that there are a thousand joules in one kilojoule. So we get 239 kilojoules per mole. All right, and that's the, and so basic, so again, sort of just to hammer this home here, what we did was we observed that the titanium aqua complex, the hexa aqua titanium two, absorbed light at 500 nanometers. There are very simple instrumentation that we can use for this, what are called spectrophotometers. Um, I'd be surprised if you guys haven't at least at one point in your career used them in the lab. Uh, there are these like little boxes. You fill these what are called cuvettes with your solution. You stick them into this little spectrophotometer and press go. And it just simply tells you the absorption that's observed and at what wavelength. So we can use this instrument to see that our titanium aqua complex here absorbs at 500 nanometers. And then we can use this formula here to figure out what this crystal field splitting energy must be. Because again, the whole shtick here is that the uh, photons that are absorbed, they're promoting electrons from the lower energy level to the higher energy level. So we can measure what that difference in energy is using those photons. 
right? Using that wavelength of the photon that's absorbed. Okay, so not only that, but we can also tell the color that's going to be absorbed. So this is what we're going to use. Whoops. This color wheel here for. Um, it turns out, so first of all, we said that what was absorbed was uh, the wavelength at 500 nanometers. Okay, so that means that my wavelength that's absorbed is in this region right here. Sort of closer to this end, I guess, but. So here's what's absorbed. So what you see when you sort of see color is the wavelength that's absorbed, you will observe the complementary color. So the thing on the opposite side of the wheel. So if that's what's absor absorbed, this is what is observed is going to be this red color here, right? What's on the opposite side of this wheel. Okay, so. Um, yeah, these are what's called the complementary color. Okay, so if something were to absorb at, let's say, 410 nanometers, what color would we observe when we, um, you know, sort of see this thing with our eyeballs here? Let's use our clicker. Give me a second. Uh, assuming that this is going to work for me. Come on. Okay. Cool. So if we say that we absorb. at 410 nanometers. Everybody take a second and tell me what you're going to observe in terms of your color that you see with your eyes. Sorry, it just got launched, so. Okay, so it's absorbing at 410, so that's going to be in this region right here. What's going to be observed is the complementary color on the other side of the wheel, so that would be yellow. Okay, again, we, what's absorbed, what you observe is the complementary color, the thing on the other side of the color wheel. Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to talk about is what's called the spectrochemical series here, okay? It turns out that each ligand has a tendency, or the, the ligand itself can influence that crystal field splitting energy, right? So actually, let me just copy this and take it back to our other page. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I'm going to get. All right, so again, this was our little diagram that we had for our octahedral that displays that crystal field splitting energy. It turns out that the ligand itself 
will have an impact on just how big the value of delta is, just how big that crystal field splitting energy is. Okay, the um, and that's what this spectrochemical series is here. All the way on this side here, these are the ligands that cause the largest delta. And on the other side are the ligands that cause the smallest delta. All right, so we said that this, um, what we observed here for our hexa aqua titanium was absorption at 500 nanometers. What about, let's try to predict then based on this spectrochemical series, what it would be if instead of having it be hexa aqua, what if we then had this hexa cyano? Okay. So again, let's use our clicker. We want to see if I want to see if you guys can think based on the fact that here's our equation, HC over lambda. Do we think that our hexacyano complex is going to absorb A at a wavelength greater than 500 or B at a wavelength less than 500? Okay, pay special attention to where that value is in this equation. Where did we plug in that wavelength into our equation, HC over lambda? All right, so this is a mixed bag here. So let's make sure that we can see this. What we can tell based on our spectrochemical series here is that the delta of water is going to be less whoops, than that crystal field, uh, crystal field splitting energy of that cyano group, right? That's what this whole spectrochemical series is telling me. This is over here at the larger CN or at the larger delta than the water. Right, that's what that's telling me here. And if we look at this equation, there's an inverse relationship between delta and that wavelength, right? Larger wavelengths mean lower energy. Shorter wavelengths mean higher energy. So this is going to absorb at a wavelength that's less than 500. A shorter energy wavelength is higher energy. Right, so if we go back to our color wheel here, whoops, I gunked it up here, let me, we said that um, our, with water, was absorbing at this wavelength of 500. If we have a cyano group, it's going to be, we don't really know where exactly, we can't predict exactly but we can say that it's definitely going to be a lower wavelength. So we would expect that compound to either be orange or yellow, depending on exactly what that is, right? So shorter wavelengths imply higher energy. Okay. So going back to this com uh, this compound here, or going back to our little chart here, actually, I'm going to take all this. And take it onto a new screen. And it froze. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So just real quick. This is our free atom. Then we had this splitting that was observed, observed, oops. We said that this distance here was that delta our crystal field splitting energy. Okay, so we talked about how it explained, help us explain the colors that were absor observed, absorbed and observed. Um, the other thing that we had talked about was magnetism. So how does this crystal field theory help us to explain the magnetic properties of these compounds? So first of all, with regard to magnetism, I'm really talking about the number of unpaired electrons in my diagram. Um, compounds that have unpaired electrons are what are called paramagnetic. They interact with the magnetic field. Compounds that have full orbitals are called diamagnetic. They do not interact with the magnetic field. So given something... Um, like our, let's just stick with this guy here. We can determine whether it is diamagnetic or paramagnetic um, given this diagram here, right? And so this is what we're going to sort of learn how to do here. So first of all, we got to figure out the configuration of this ion here. This corresponds to, because those waters are neutral, this is just a titanium with an oxidation state of plus two, right? I can tell that from my formula here based on the fact that those waters are neutral, so they're not going to influence that. And so then I need to be able to look at my periodic table and tell what the electron configuration for this ion is. This is what we discussed uh, when we first introduced chapter 21, 26, sorry. So going back to our periodic table, Here is titanium. It's in that 3D block. So just real quick, 1S2, 2S2. Four S2, 3D2. If we look at then the titanium two plus ion, Remember, I'm going to start taking electrons away from this configuration here, and the first ones to go are going to be these 4s electrons, right? So this is going to have these same core electrons, but now 3d2. Okay, so if I go back to my, my splitting diagram here, whoops, that's not the right course. If I look at my electron configuration here, the last orbital is this 3D2, which means I'm going to place two electrons. Remember, you half fill these orbitals first. So this complex indeed does have unpaired electrons and thus would be paramagnetic, right? So titanium uh, or hexa aqua titanium has two unpaired electrons. All right, so let's do another one. Start over with this diagram here. We're going to do a new compound. All right, so now we're going to do we're going to do an iron compound here. So this 
we're going to take a look at something similar, but now it's going to be Fe H2O six plus two. So again, we're going to need that electron configuration for iron when it's all by itself. That ends in a one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's going to have a 3D6 orbital as its last orbital to be filled. Since I'm talking about the iron two ion, Right, again, my oxidation number, my net charge of this complex is plus two. But since water is a neutral ligand, that's also the charge of my uh, ion. And those two electrons that are lost are lost from that 4s orbital. So this is 3d6. Okay, so now going back to our diagram here, we need to fill in this configuration here with now six orbitals. Okay, so there's gonna be, this is the last uh, kind of tricky bit here for this particular chapter is when we look at our electrochemical <laughs> series, remember these are organized from, these are the smaller deltas and these are the large deltas. Roughly speaking, there's a cutoff here, okay? These lower splitting energy ligands produce what are called high spin complexes. And these larger splitting energy ligands call, cause what are called low spin complexes. So what the heck am I talking about here? Let's go back to our diagram. Water, we said, so, so sorry, first of all, we're now going to do this diagram for and we said that this is this 3D6. So we have to fill this in with six electrons. Water is one of these high spin ligands, right, with a lower delta crystal field splitting energy. So what does that mean? What that means is when I'm starting to fill in my electrons into this diagram here, I'm gonna start just like I normally would, filling all of these half filled. But because water is a high spin ligand, it turns out that this difference in energy is quite small, right? So what that means is now when I'm starting to fill in, it's small enough that instead of doubling up here, the electron actually would rather not have to share its orbital with a partner, right? It's got that repulsive interaction with this electron down here. So it's just going to fill that next orbital up. So one, two, three, four, five. Now I'll go back and double up. So this is a high spin complex with four unpaired electrons because water is a high spin ligand, meaning I'm going to fill in all of those d orbitals, okay? So this is, again, so four unpaired, and that's because we had a high spin ligand. So now let's do the exact same thing. But now we're going to use, so we're going to use that same iron ion, but now we're going to change the ligand around. So let me empty out my diagram here. We're going to use that same iron two ion, but now we're going to have our ligand be these six cyano groups 
Um, it's still the iron two ion. So hopefully everybody he can see from this formula here how I'm getting that it's still an iron two ion because each one of those cyano ligands has a negative one charge. Okay, so that means this is still going to be that 3D6 configuration. But now when I go back and look at my spectrochemical series here, this is a low spin ligand with a very large delta. So what does that mean? So again, we called this one a low spin. And so what that means is that the difference in energy between these, whoa, difference in energy between these orbitals is now much greater, right? So that's what this delta sort of means. So for a... this crystal field splitting energy, low spin means large delta. And so why does this resolve, result in a low spin complex? Because now I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna fill it in with my six electrons. I'm gonna start it off as normal, one, two, three. But now the electron, the next one that I put in, it can't go up here. This is just too high of energy. So it's going to double back up down here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So this compound here has zero unpaired electrons, right? So we had water, H2O was a high spin ligand. So this meant that my crystal field splitting energy for high spin, was a small delta. So then I go through and I fully fill all of those orbital, or rather I go through and I half fill all those orbitals before I start doubling up, which is what led me to conclude that there were four unpaired electrons, right? That's why it's called the high spin complex, because you're going to have more unpaired electrons when you start to fill in. I did the took the exact same transition metal ion but now I paired it with this cyano group, which is a low spin ligand. And since it was a low spin ligand, that led to a large delta, right? Large crystal field splitting energy. So then I'm going to fill in those lower energy three orbitals completely before I then go to these higher energy orbitals here, which is why this had zero unpaired electrons and thus is termed the low spin complex, okay? So based on what your ligand is, that will lead to a different splitting energy. Smaller splitting energies will result in these high spin complexes. And that's because we've, um, in the high spin complexes, we half fill, all orbitals first. We have these other ligands that lead to large spinning, splitting energies, and we call these our low spin complexes because we fill only the lowest energy, the three lowest energy orbitals first. Okay, so not only do these color, uh, do these different ligands lead to different colored complexes, that's what we saw at the beginning here when we were calculating lambda, because of the fact that some of them have lower deltas compared to other ones which lead to larger deltas, right, so that's going to influence what uh, wavelength of photon is being absorbed. It'll also influence the magnetic properties because of the number of unpaired electrons, right? So certain ligands, which are high spin ligands, you're going to go through and half fill all these orbitals because of that small delta. Other ligands, these low spin ligands lead to large deltas, 
which is going to make it so that the difference in energy is too great, and we're going to only fill those lower energy orbitals first. If there was more than six electrons, then you would go by or go back and start filling these upper energy orbitals, but only when those lower three are completely full. All right, so um, we're going to sort of pick this up and expand this comp, uh, this sort of same logic to the tetrahedral and the square planar. Um, but you can see that really the only difference is going to be that splitting pattern that's observed. Observed. So for octahedrals, we had three low energy orbitals and two high energy orbitals. For the tetrahedral and the square planar, you get a different distribution of orbitals. Uh, because of the repulsion of those ligands. But we'll we'll sort of pick up with that on Wednesday.